She started her career singing in lounges and casinos, but it was her unprecedented winning streak on TV's Star Search that really helped her take off. That memorable turn introduced her to composer Frank Wildhorn and led to a starring stage role in his production of Jekyll and Hyde. A decade later, Jekyll hit Broadway and she was well on her way following up her stage triumph with a series of critically acclaimed albums and sold-out concerts. Hello, I'm Ernie Manoos. Coming up on this episode of Interviews, our conversation with singer Linda Etter. Is it more difficult to do a song that people are more familiar with? I think in some ways, because they sometimes know the lyrics better than you do. If you're performing it live (laughs) and you happen to mix something around, I think it's more difficult if it's a song that was associated with an icon. There are people in this world who really don't think you should do the music of icons. Right. But uh, it's a challenge, and and that adds an exciting element to it. See, I would think like Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Nobody else is ever going to sing it because everyone's got it in their mind how it should sound with a different artist. But often singers do sing it. Yes. What is it you bring new and fresh? And can you? Or are you kind of tied in to what people are expecting? I really don't think my version is anything like Judy's. And, and I wouldn't want it to be. I think hers is the definitive version associated with her. Right. The minute you hear it, you think Judy Garland. But it is such a gorgeous song with such a perfect lyric married to that melody that that's I think why a lot of people want to sing it it it, once you've sung the song you really sort of understand why and I've heard a variety of arrangements to that song mine just came about really through just sitting down and singing it and to me it's very sad so I sing a very sad much more quiet version than Judy did and that's just you know the way it came out but Garland always somebody you loved always she's really the reason I'm a singer yeah. I remember vividly being eight years old, sitting on the floor next to my dad, and I can still see the ugly green shag carpeting we had and the black and white TV. <laughs> we had black and white TV for a long time before we got color. And The Wizard of Oz, first time ever seeing it, and when she came out and did Somewhere Over the Rainbow, it just changed something in me. It, it really was a galvanizing moment. That's why I remember it so clearly. So I, I have thanked her for that and my whole career, really, because yeah. she gave me a focus and a passion and something that I desperately wanted to do, and a lot of people don't ever find that. If things had gone differently, what do you think you'd be doing today? Well, I'm actually one of those people, I've always thought of myself as being B-plus at a lot of things, and I always worried that I wouldn't be A-plus at anything, because I have a lot of different artistic sort of creative talents, and generally people who, are, who have that are terrible at math, <laughs> which I am. Uh, but there, I'm good at writing. I'm good at art. I was going to be an artist. I thought I would be too shy to, to sing, so I was going to paint. Uh, I love to build things and create. I have a very creative uh, nature, and I, I've always been that way. I remember as a kid feeling that urge to create something, and I would walk around our garage just looking, thinking, okay, I'll see something, and it'll spark an idea, because I had to get that out. Yeah. When you aren't on stage then, performing, when you aren't singing... How do you do it in regular life? What do you use as your artistic outlet? Well, I did a lot of painting. Uh, I sort of put that aside when I had my son because when you have a little child, you, you, there's no time. When I paint, I want to paint all day long. Um, but I like to garden. Uh, horses are a big passion of mine. I, I say garden, but I mean I literally will dig fence posts and big, build things. You know? <laughs> I have a, a miter saw. Because <laughs> you have a farm and you've got animals mm-hmm. and do all of yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, take me back, though. When you first got into this whole business, if I understand it correctly, you got into the beauty pageant circuit so that you could sing. Yeah, I said circuit, it doesn't really apply to me because a lot of people will try a few different pageants and then eventually go on and be successful. I entered the Miss Brainerd pageant, which is part of the Miss America pageant, when I was in high school and right after I, you know, graduated. And I, I, seriously, I did it because I wanted to have a I wanted to be on stage and sing, and, you know, the American pageant has talent. So I wrote my song, and, and I happened to win it. I didn't really expect that. I, I really just wanted to win the talent competition. And so then you went on to Miss Minnesota. Yeah, was fourth runner up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but then I hear, then, then you worked. You were working, so you were also doing hotels and stuff like that with a friend of yours. Started right around. away, right out of high school. I actually, I, my, the guy that I started with, whose name was Paul, he played keyboards, 
and we also sang together. He was a year younger, so I went to community college in Brainerd for a year while I waited for him to graduate and took things for fun, you know. Yeah. Um, and then we started. We worked at the Holiday Inn in Brainerd, and then it went from there. We got one job after another, and there was no turning back, really. Eventually, you were doing stuff in casinos. Yes. Atlantic City? Harrah's Casino at Atlantic City was our, was our big break, you know. <laughs> Three months of six show, uh, six days a week, four shows a night. How do you do that? How do you bring anything I don't know. to the stage I don't at that know. point? If I had to do it again today, I don't know that I could. I mean, thank God I was 20 years old or something. Um, it's, it's, it's exhausting, and I had never really even been away from home before yeah. for any length of time. So it was quite the eye-opening experience, but it was a training ground. I learned how to be an entertainer there because the audiences are a mixture of people who are depressed because they've well, lost a lot of money or they're, they've been drinking too much and they're, or they're just not really there to hear music. They're there to sit down and rest for a second before they go back out and hit the, right. the machines or whatever. And then you have the constant sound of slot machines because they want it open to that room. They don't want people to stay too long. And then you have this certain number that come for the music because in those days there was a lot more music going on. You found several lounges in each casino and it was a great place for, for performers like myself. But you learned... You learned how to entertain or you died. Yeah. And then in that course of time, somewhere along there, if I remember, on the same day you had two major events happen. One was you were going to do horse show and you were going to audition for Star Search. Is that correct? Yes. On the same day? It just, you know, that's Murphy's Law. Everything happens on the same day. But Yeah, people had been telling us for years, Paul and I, uh, you know, why don't you try out for Star Search? But they didn't have a category for a duo, and that's really what we were. So we... We just came up again, and I auditioned we, um, and got, got on the show. And it happened to be I had a horse show that morning, so I got up really early and fixed my hair, you know, as well as, well as I could, and put my makeup on in preparation for the Star Search audition. But it was 1,000 degrees in this hippodrome in Minneapolis. And <laughs> I won my class, but I literally ran off the, off the ring and threw the rain to a friend of mine who was helping, and then jump in the car of another friend that was with the motor running, and we raced <laughs> over there. But I look back on that as being good for me because I'm a nervous performer. I, I don't have the kind of confidence that I just walk into a room and say, you're just going to love what I do. You know, I've never been that way. I will never be that way. I don't know that it necessarily would want to be, but I get nervous, I, I, uh, and I didn't have a chance to. I just literally ran up onto the stage and sang my two songs, and I knew I had done well. They told me right away that... Uh, Gave me the feeling that I had done well, but you never know. You know, it just worked. It was meant to be. I, it's interesting you, you say know. about being nervous. Though. Even today, do you still get nervous Absolutely. before you go out there? Absolutely. What are you, what are you thinking? What's the fear that's going to happen, do you think? I think I feel like a phony or an imposter. You know, it, it, there's still in me the little Minnesota farm girl from a very humble background. And uh, I feel so fortunate to be doing what I'm doing. There are times when I still stand up on a stage and think, I can't believe that this is my job and that people yeah. actually come pay money to see me sing. You know, there, there will always be that element to it. So, yeah, I get nervous because of that. I want to do a good job. I, there, do you think if you weren't nervous that you would give something different to the audience, that you would change as a person? And do you think that kind of keeps you? Well, I would probably lose my adrenaline rush, which is so much a part of performing, and I'd never want to lose that. There are two types of performers, I think. There's the type that stands up on a stage with basically their eyes closed and say, saying, this is what I do. If you like it, great, come to me. If you don't, I'm, I'm not changing anything. This is what I am. And then there's the other type, which was Judy, which was, you don't like that? Okay, I'll change it. Wait, tell me what you want. I'll give you everything I have. <laughs> um, I fall more into that category. I'm very much in tune with the audience. I want to please them. Uh, so, yeah, that makes me nervous. Are you like that in every aspect of your life, that wanting to please? Yeah. My sister always says to me, you care too much about what people think of you. But I can't help it. That's who I am. Yeah. Okay. Back to Star Search then. I went off for a little bit. You're on for 12 or 13 weeks. Win, 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 win. Do you remember who you lost to? Uh, didn't lose. Didn't lose? Was... They just took you away after 13 weeks? No. That was when they divided the season. It used to go all the way through, and then they realized that's not a good idea because if someone goes undefeated, they have no competitor for the final. So they split it in half. Remember Sam Harris? You know, we right. went all the way through and practically, and um, they split it shortly thereafter. So they put me on the first show of season one, and I went undefeated and then waited while they filmed round two, and I competed against uh, Didi Belson. Didi Louis, Belson. Louis what Belson happened to Didi? Belson and Pearl Bailey's daughter. 
Uh, I hear periodically from uh, people that I know associated with her, so, you know, singing and doing okay. Really? Mm-hmm. So, do you ever watch American Idol? I do. What I didn't do watch think? so much the first season, but I, I have uh, started TiVoing it. <laughs> 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 because there are some great singers on there. I really enjoy hearing the singers. I think it's good because it, it's another way for young performers to be discovered. And for that reason, it's great. We don't have a lot of talent competitions. I think it's terrible for the fact that it's a reality show in a way, and it exploits people yeah. to have the highest entertainment value. That I don't like. And, and they may think they're not damaging those young people, but I, I, I know they are. Because I was on Star Search where we, the judges were not allowed to talk. You know, they just could write their number down. And I would see competitors up on the stage smiling when they lost, looking like, I'm okay. And I'd be off stage, and the minute they got up past that camera, they burst out into tears. I mean, it's, it's traumatic. You know, singing is personal. It's right. a physical part of you. So it's like having your person be insulted in a way. Is there a difference then between the real audition process and what you see on these TV shows? Isn't there that same kind of... I mean, if you go and audition for a Broadway producer, and then they're like, no, out of here. Isn't that the same thing, or are these different? In a Broadway... Uh, audition, which I haven't done a lot of. If I had to audition much, I wouldn't get anything because I'm too nervous. I'm terrible, really, in auditions. But they really don't say anything. The hardest part of a Broadway audition is the time it takes to walk out of the room after you've finished in silence because they don't say much to you. You, just, you get a vibe whether or not you're doing well. If you're what they're looking for, you could do well but not be what they're looking for. So, um, Or you could do ter- terribly. You don't, you don't ever know. But you have that moment where it seems like five miles to the door. Yeah. That's the hardest part. American Idol, they're allowed to spew, for entertainment's sake, whatever they want to say about these kids, and and they do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, We finish up with Star Search. We move on. Next thing, Frank Wildhorn, Jekyll and Hyde. How many, 12 years of your life put into that project? (sighs) Obviously, many more years for Frank, because he wrote that at USC. He started, I became involved with Jekyll and Hyde in 19, end of 1987. And we did our first production here, you know, in Houston at the Alley Theater in 90. And then it was just a series of different things leading up to Broadway. It was the workshop in New York. It was the uh, double cast. Well, first the highlights out before we ever did Houston. And then Houston. Then the workshop. Then the the double album. And then the year-long tour before Broadway. Then Broadway. And then the cast album. So, yeah, a lot lot of time, a lot of years. What do you think was different for your process? I mean, granted, most Broadway shows don't have this kind of life till they get to the stage with, of course, the same cast even. What did you learn doing that, going through that? What do you think was the benefit of that kind of an experience for a show? Well, my character, unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, didn't really change much. I I was allowed to be sort of Linda Etter in that. I acted, I guess, a little bit, but not really. They created this role around me, so I was able to go up there and just really be myself and blast out these big songs. Uh, well, but I think what I learned in general is how important it is not to give up, because Frank never gave up. And if he had given up, I gave up years before the show ever hit Broadway. I was saying, <laughs> why don't we just quit? Why don't we just move on to the next idea? You know? And he wouldn't, and you know, he persevered and was ultimately successful because of it. How soon after the first Concepts album came out did you realize this thing clicked, that people were buying it? I mean, I remember finding that CD back in Chicago long before I knew of the show. It was finding an audience. I don't think I really did. I mean, I was so new to the whole record thing. Um, I don't think I knew until Houston. And really none of us knew until that very first night of previews what the reaction we got. We didn't know. Um, and then, of course, the, the, the night we opened and then when the reviews came out, I'll never forget that night. I've never been reviewed really in that capacity before. As a singer, yes, but not for so-called acting. Um, <laughs> Do you know what it said? Again, I was so nervous. Do you what remember it? what it said? Well, I, it's interesting because I just spoke with Everett Evans, who interviewed me for that, and gave me my first great rave review. And, I, and I, I'll never forget it because we were sitting in a restaurant waiting, and I had a big plate of spaghetti in front of me. I was absolutely starving. I had probably not eaten that whole day, midnight or whatever, and I'm... The review came, and I just remember I never stopped eating. I don't even think I was aware <laughs> that I was just inhaling this pasta as they were reading the review, and it was a great review. And um, that was it was quite the night. If you had failed as an actress, would that have damaged what you were doing? Or because you think of yourself or thought of yourself as a singer, this was a side job? 
Well, that, sh- that show was so much about singing for me. It, w- it really was a sung through musical. I didn't really consider myself an actress until I did Camille Claudel. Really? Yeah, that's a, a show we did. and uh, We've only done the one production of it. It's a true story, and I don't know whether it will move on from that point ever. I don't know. But I worked for a year with a coach prior to that. And that's a book musical. You could remove the songs and still have a play. Right. And it's a real woman with an incredibly dramatic life, an incredible love story, uh, highs and lows like you can't believe. And I, and I, I think I, I, I really believe I did a good job. I worked yeah. really hard, and I felt great in the part. That's when I knew that I could act. It wasn't in Jekyll. I didn't know in Jekyll if I could act or not. Even walking out on Broadway on the first time? No, I just remember opening night of Broadway. I cried at the curtain call because it had taken so long to get there. I was like, I'm so relieved. <laughs> Thank God, you know, we're finally here. Yeah. Okay, when you perform and you're singing with symphonies, when you're singing in concert, what discipline is different in that than acting? You talk about taking a year to hone that craft, but aren't you presenting a song in some way the same way as an actor acts? Yes. As far as working with symphony, um, it's... It's a concert, and at first I was very much intimidated by symphonies because it's a symphony. You know, there's, a, there's an element to them. It's very elegant, and there's a seriousness that I associated with it, which isn't ultimately true. They're people, and, and they're just as fun as anybody else. But you, I felt like I had to be very, you know, like this, you mm-hmm. know, and that's not me. That's not the way I perform, and it took me a while to realize I can, the show would go better if I just relaxed and was the Linda that I always am in my own concerts, which is f- free and will say, you know, do just about anything that, yeah. that hits me. But the acting discipline, is there, do you perform a song like an actor presents or no? Is Certain that songs definitely are three-act plays. And you, in order to do them well, you have to act them. Although I've, I've never had a problem acting within a song. That's not something anyone ever taught me. Because I didn't study for acting or singing it was automatically there. It, they were my real feelings from the, from the very beginning. When I f- first started singing, I hardly moved my body. My, m- my emotion was still there in my face, and it was still in the song. And that just happened innately. That's not something anyone taught me. I'm not sure why. I think it's because I come from a very stoic Midwestern family, Scandinavian mother, you know, very Igmar Bergman. <laughs> a lot of love there, but you didn't really show it. Right. And so for me, it was such an outlet to get on the stage and be allowed to show emotions. So they always were very real, whether I was singing a sad song or a happy song. It was, it was always easy for me to connect to that real emotion. Do you have to personally connect with a song to sing it, or could someone just say, here, sing this, and you could give a, a stellar performance with it? If it's my kind of song, where meaning it's the right dress, you know, <laughs> it fits me, then it happens automatically. If it's a song that... I can maybe pull off, but I really probably shouldn't be doing. Then I have to work harder to just make it okay. Right. And that's become very apparent to me over the years. I have, you know, everyone goes through stuff. And I've been through some stuff in the last few years that actually helped me relate more to lyrics. Everything you do in life, you bring to your songs. When I had a child, that was a huge bump up in understanding the world in a different way. Going through some personal stuff is another way that suddenly the, the lyrics take on a whole other level of, of meaning. Yeah. When you go back now after living through what you've gone on with and you go back to the old songs, does something new come to oh, those? Oh, yeah. yeah. Especially yeah. because so many of them were written for me by Frank. So there's no question that that's, it's sort of, they sort of became our, our history and our life. You and Frank were together, had done all of this work together, and now you're, as the album says, by myself. Right. Is that hard for you creatively? Were you out there now in a sense without a net? Or had you gotten strong enough that this wasn't hard for you? Well, the, the interesting thing with Frank and I is that we both brought things to the table. And we both were sort of at the same place in our careers when we met. So uh, there's never been any denying that we, we were both contributing. We both helped each other. Um, I happen, he's not lazy when it comes to his job. He's 24-7 into that. I'm, I have a lot of interest, so I can be lazy. I can one day of the week be just as, you know gung-ho about the work, and the next day I'd rather go riding or something. So right. there's a part of me that will let other people do things for me, but ultimately not be happy that I did because I'm a complete know-it-all. <laughs> it doesn't really go hand in hand. I should be a perfectionist. I mean, I'm a perfectionist. I'm a lazy perfectionist. That's my problem. <laughs> I know what I want, and I know what to do a lot of the time, but I'll be lazy and let other people do it half okay. the time. 
And now I, I can't do that anymore. And I, I actually am enjoying that. I'm, as I keep saying, I stole this saying from a dear friend of mine who passed away not long ago, Carl Anderson, about driving your own bus. And mm-hmm. I feel very much like I'm driving my bus again. And, and I am ultimately that kind of person, so that feels good. So why the name By Myself then for the album? Because it, it really is me picking what I want to do and being ultimately responsible for what I do, even though the album idea was not mine initially. It was brought to me by Ian Ralfini and Ettore Estrada, who produced it, Ian Ralfini from Angel, my label. Uh, they came with this idea, and I just, the minute I heard it, I thought it was a great idea. I'd been to very much all on the Judy fence. Songs. Yes, I'd been very much on the fence as far as what kind of record to make next. It was my eighth solo album. I always like to try a little bit different for each record, although I ultimately know what I do the best. So I didn't know what to do, and when I heard it, I thought I was the right person, and it was the right time in my life to do a tribute album, and she was the perfect person to do a tribute to. Yeah. Are there certain things that you look back on your career and those are the certain moments? Those are the things, and what comes to mind for me that I I wonder how you react to, the Olympics. And hearing your song while the Olympics are on TV, you know, is that a moment that was big for you or no? Well, that moment was colored by the fact that we were disappointed that they didn't announce what it was. Every other song on that program got announced, whether it was incidental music or or whatnot. All the three announced, they were constantly saying, oh, this is from so-and-so, this is from so-and-so. And here comes our big song, gold. which had just we had just put out the album Gold, and that song was on it, and here we are, it's the Olympics, it's this great exposure, and they never said what it was. So we were all like, oh, you know, <laughs> oh my God. You know, it, it, it was one of those moments that could have been so much better, and yet it was tainted by that. Yeah. Do you know why? I think they just got talking. They were, they were got into their, you know, they give commentary while the song was going on and Christy was skating, and it just... For some reason, they forgot. Yeah. I'd like to ask them personally yeah. why. <laughs> I wasn't really happy that night. But. Oh, so then that clouded what could have been yeah. probably. Yeah. But it's, meant, it's what's meant to be. I always feel very much like my life is what it's meant to be. I've always felt like fate had a big part of it. I always knew when the hand of fate was coming in, It was because it was so clear and definite when it was being pushed a certain way. And, you know, you're meant to do what you're meant to do. I'm, I'm meant to have whatever is coming to me, so. Yeah. And I've been very lucky. You did uh, get to meet someone. I don't know if you knew her before, but you got to be on Martha Stewart's show. And I hear that she's a big, you're a big fan of hers, and that you painted a picture for her. Actually, I drew a pen and ink of a Frisian horse, because she's got Frisians, and I also have a Frisian. And I wanted to give her something. Yeah. And what do you give Martha Stewart? So <laughs> I thought that would I right. So, I yeah. thought that would be one thing I could do. So I did a, and I didn't want it to be big because the woman's got everything, and I'm sure she does not have a lot of wall space. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I made a very little, you know, head and shoulder of a Frisian, which is a beautiful black horse with long flowing mane. They all look the same. And then I spent I spent more time picking the frame because, <laughs> again, it's Martha Stewart, so it has you know. You know and I did. I think she was very pleased with it, and I felt good about that. Had you known her before? No. So my mother like? had introduced me to her, and there's a part of me that wants to be Martha Stewart and since, you know, wants that house to be perfect and things decorated the right way and food cooked the right way. And I don't come anywhere near that. But So do you still get that thrill meeting people that are in the public eye? Oh, yeah. Really? Mm-hmm. It's not like, oh, I know how this works. I've been there. Jim Courier was on the plane with me flying here. <laughs> really? <laughs> There's just something about meeting people that have been on TV. And I sat there thinking about it, too. I said, this is just a very nice man. He's a wonderful athlete. And uh, why, why, why do we look at celebrity in a certain way? But we do. You know? Why do we, do you think? I, I have no idea. I guess because they're, celebrities are maybe doing something that we secretly would like to do or we associate them with having something more. But it's not really accurate. You know, every other person on the planet could be a celebrity if the right set of circumstances happened. And nowadays, anybody can be with reality TV. So, but it's fun. You know, I guess celebrity is fun. Does it get tired being a celebrity? Well, I consider myself a, a minor celebrity, and I actually like that. I'm known as being the reluctant diva. That's a term that was coined for me, and it's really kind of true because I have had enough of a taste of fame, real fame, to know that it's not necessarily, there's a level of it that is not necessarily something that I could handle. Because I'm, I'm very much independent and a little bit private yeah. in, in certain ways. And I like the fact that 
I, I do have a certain level of celebrity, and yet I can go out looking like a slob, you know, and not worry about <laughs> it and walk around and not be bothered. Um, people will ultimately come up to me at the, the worst possible time. <laughs> in fact, there was an incident that happened here in Houston, which I tell people about. I, it was during Jekyll. I, I looked horrible. I was so exhausted, and I went out to a record store wearing a rag of a dress or something. I mean, I looked bad. There's no other way around it. <laughs> and I was walking around the aisles, and a little guy was, every time I looked up, there was the same little man standing there. And I thought, oh, my God, he recognizes me, and I just look terrible. And I, Nowadays, I wouldn't care, I'd say but back then I was mortified, and so I kept trying to hide. And every time I and I thought I'd lost him, and all of a sudden I turned around, and he's right there. And he said, "Are you Linda Edder?" And I said, "No, I just lied. <laughs> I, I could. I didn't even know that was going to come out of my mouth, but I was so ter- mortified at the thought of somebody <laughs> recognizing me looking like that." Yeah. Does it stand in your way then about if you're looking at something to do something else in your career? Do you ever think to yourself? What this will bring me as far as attention, what this will bring as far as and you say, and there's the balance there. I don't know if you can find the question in what I'm asking, but does it ever stand in your way of doing something else? Do you ever say, I don't want that. I want what I have here. Well, my career, I love to travel, but there are times when I don't want to go anywhere. I mean, I'm, I'm also a homebody and I have a child, so I have to always compromise and sacrifice and try to do both. And you always have a working mother's guilt. Right. Um, but ultimately, it's given me such an amazing life. So it's a trade-off. You know, the problem with it is there, are, and like I'm sure everybody, every celebrity would probably say the same thing. But you can't have what you really want is the ability to turn it on and off. Right. Well, we're happy you haven't turned it off. We're out of time. <laughs> Linda Etter, thank you so much You're for welcome. sitting down. Great with to us. see you again, Linda Etter. To order a transcript, call 866-652-3378 or send $6.95 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest.